My topic today is denialism in medicine, statin denialists and others. Now, denial is not just a river in Egypt. It's a defense mechanism, and people use it to help them cope with unpleasant realities by denying that they exist. And I'll give you some examples of that. There was a woman who had cancer, and her oncologist told her she needed surgery and chemotherapy. And she didn't like that idea. She wanted a natural treatment. And she found someone, probably one of Britt's colleagues, to uh, oblige her and treat her naturally. And he convinced her that she, he, he had cured her. So she went back to the oncologist and said, my cancer's gone. And the oncologist said, really? Let's take a follow-up x-ray and confirm that. And he took an x-ray and he showed it to her and he pointed and he said, look, the cancer's still there. It's just as big as it always was. And she looked at the x-ray and she said, that's not cancer, that's just a shadow where the cancer used to be. And uh, I can understand people wanting to deny cancer because that's a pretty scary proposition, but people use denial for a lot more trivial reasons. For one thing, they use it to deny that they're wrong. People hate to admit that they've been wrong about something. They feel that it diminishes them as a, as a person and exposes them to ridicule. You know, my grandmother used to tell a story about one of our elderly relatives. We'll call her Aunt Betsy. Aunt Betsy didn't eat sardines, and she was very outspoken about it. She told everybody, I don't eat sardines. Well, one day a fisherman friend of my grandmother's happened to have brought her a mess of freshly caught large uh, sardines, and she was in the kitchen frying them up when Aunt Betsy happened to come in. And Aunt Betsy said, that smells good, can I have some? And she ate some, and she said, Mary, that was really good fish. What kind of fish was that anyway? And my grandmother told her that was sardines. And Aunt Betsy was indignant. She said, that was not sardines. I don't eat sardines. <laughs> <laughs> and denial is a very, one of the more primitive defense mechanisms. And children start using it at an early age. I had a patient once, a little preschool boy, probably three or four years old. And I'd been asked to check him for inguinal hernia. And this meant I had to pull his pants down and probe his groin with my finger. Well, he was wearing one of those knit stocking caps. And as I started to pull his pants down, he reached up with both hands and pulled the stocking cap down over his eyes and over his whole face as if to say, I can't see you. This isn't really happening. Um, and in science, Denial is rejecting evidence that uh, contradicts your beliefs. And Ken Ham is a perfect example of that. Um, did any of you see that, uh, the video of the debate that, that he had with uh, Bill Nye, the science guy? Well, if you missed it, uh, never mind. This cartoon tells you everything you know, need to know about that debate. Bill Nye, uh, presented the argument for evolution. And he had uh, a massive evidence, every single real scientific paper published in the last 150 years. Now, Ken Ham held up the Bible and he said, I have this book. That was basically his argument against evolution. Now, to his mind, the theory of evolution is completely incompatible with the story of, of God's creation in the Bible. So Ken Ham thinks that they can't both be true, and he knows the Bible is true because that's the word of God, and it's the basis of his, everything he believes. So he has no option but to reject science. But at least he understands what he's rejecting. And not everybody does. There are people who reject evolution that don't really understand the first thing about it. And one of those is my neighbor. She told me, I don't know much about evolution, but I've heard that they date the fossils from the rock layers, and then they date the rock layers from the fossils, so that doesn't make any sense. Well, she's a nice lady and a good neighbor, and I didn't want to start a fight, so I bit my tongue. I had to bite it really hard. I think I may still have a scar. <laughs> uh, I, I wanted to scream at her and say, 
if you don't know much about evolution, why on earth didn't you try to find out something about it before you formed an opinion? Uh, if she had tried to learn something about evolution, she would have realized that what she had heard was simply not true. And she would have learned that evolution doesn't just depend on rock layers and fossils. Evolution is based on a, a, a convergence of evidence from all kinds of different fields, from um, comparative anatomy and physiology, biogeography, molecular, geog molecu molecular biology, genetics, and a lot of other fields. In fact, the truth of evolution would be just as well established if we didn't have any fossil record at all. Now, my neighbor didn't follow my rule, the skeptic rule which is before you accept a claim, try to find out who disagrees with it and why. If she'd done that, she would have found out about all the scientists who disagree with, disagreed with that uh, idiotic statement that she had heard and relied on. Now, you've prob you're probably most familiar with denialism in the form of climate change denialists. Now, they like to call themselves climate change skeptics, but they go far beyond skepticism to denial, dismissal, and unwarranted doubt. Uh, do you know who Senator Emhoff is? He's the one who brought the snowball into the Senate chamber to show everybody that global warming wasn't happening. And he called global warming the greatest hoax ever perpetuated, ever perpetrated against the American people. And Donald Trump famously tweeted, the concept of global warming was created by and for the Chinese in order to make U.S. manufacturing non-competitive. I don't think so. Now, you might wonder what motivates these people. Well, for one thing, the idea that our entire planet is in danger is pretty scary. And people don't want to feel frightened. They don't want to have to change their behavior. They don't uh, want to be made to feel guilty if they don't change their behavior and stop driving their gas guzzlers. And they don't want increased government regulation and they don't want anybody to interfere with liberty and freedom. They don't want anybody telling them what they should do. And there's probably a lot of other reasons too. Uh, flat Earth, the believers in, in flat Earth are denialists too. Shaquille O'Neal is one of them. You know, uh, some of these flat earthers are, are pretty sophisticated. They come up with all kinds of rationalizations to explain away the evidence. And they dream up these convoluted conspiracy theories. NASA is covering up the truth. The moon landings were a hoax. The pictures from outer space were just photoshopped. But uh, Shaquille O'Neal has a more simplistic explanation. He says, I drive from Florida to California all the time, and it's flat to me. I do not go up and down at a 360 degree angle and all that stuff about gravity. <laughs> what? Now, that's not just ignorant, that's so incoherent that it isn't even wrong. <laughs> up and down at a 300 and... Anyway. Uh, his belief in a flat earth probably isn't going to hurt him, but when it comes to denialism in medicine, people die. Now, science has determined that AIDS is caused by the HIV virus, and that's well established, and it's, it's the basis of uh, the development of drugs that have turned AIDS from a, a death sentence into a chronic disease that can be managed and that doesn't even decrease the lifespan by very much. But um, despite the compelling evidence, some, some scientists who ought to know better are still claiming that HIV is a harmless virus and that AIDS is caused by other things like sexual behavior, recreational drugs, malnutrition, poor sanitation, hemophilia, or even by the very drug used to treat HIV. And in South Africa, President Thabo Mbeki was a denialist, and so was the health minister who believed that AIDS could be treated with garlic, beetroot, and lemon juice. And thanks to their policies, patients in South Africa didn't get effective treatment with, with uh, 
antiretroviral drugs. And as a result, at least 330,000 people died. 171 new HIV, 171,000 new HIV infections and 35,000 infants were infected. That didn't need to happen. Uh, one commenter called this, to, this tragedy a genocide by sloth. And some people even deny the germ theory of disease. Now, last year at Nexus, I talked about functional medicine. And functional medicine claims that germs can't hurt you as long as you're in optimum health. And Mark Hyman is a functional medicine specialist, and he says it's not germs, it's the interaction between, germ with, between our genes and the environment. And um, I had a chiropractor tell me, germs don't cause disease. If they did, we'd all be dead. <laughs> and he firmly believed that if you kept your spine in proper alignment, germs could not hurt you. Uh, this morning, David Gorski talked about the anti-vaxxers. Well, anti vaccine denialism has been with us for a long time, essentially as long as we've had vaccines. Now, one of the first ways to prevent smallpox was to inoculate people with cowpox. It's a related virus. And they'd take pus from cowpox lesions and, and inoculate people with it. And it, it actually worked. It was a good way to prevent smallpox before we had a specific smallpox vaccine. And this cartoon in 1802 is making fun of people who've been inoculated with cowpox. It shows them growing little cows out of every part of their anatomy. And uh, some people deny attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Steve Novella wrote an article about that for science-based medicine. This psychologist says that it, ADHD isn't real because you can't see it and there's no test for it. And Steve pointed out that the same can be say, said of migraine. Uh, there's no test for migraine. You can't see migraine, but we have accurate ways to diagnose and treat it. And he said, perhaps he thinks that migraines are an invention of the neurologist headache pharmaceutical industry. <laughs> I like that. Uh, and some people deny the whole concept of mental illness. A psychiatrist named Thomas Saz wrote this book, The Myth of Mental Illness. He says there's no such thing as mental illness. It's, it was all made up to allow, allow society to control nonconformists and to lock people up. So you've probably heard of a lot of these denialists, but you may not have heard the term statin denialism. I think I was the first to use it in an article I wrote for Skeptical Inquirer. Um, statins are a class of medications that lower cholesterol and that have been shown to reduce the risk of heart attacks. There's compelling scientific evidence, but some people, including some scientists and doctors, have rejected the evidence and they have demonized statins in various ways sometimes in ways that are demonstrably false and sometimes in ways that are downright hilarious. And I want to share some of the hilarious ones with you and then we'll get back to some real facts about statins. This is Leonard Coldwell. He has no medical or scientific credentials, but he bills himself as the world's leading authority on cancer. He claims to have treated 35,000 cancer patients with a 92.3% cure rate. I don't believe that, do you? He has a YouTube video uh, entitled Statin Drugs Are Useless. And it's the worst example of statin denial that I have ever seen. He, he presents alternative facts that are easily demolished by a little rudimentary fact checking. And essentially everything he says in that video is wrong. And some of it is high comedy. He says statins are mass murder. Well, I, I wonder what dictionary he's using because my dictionary says that murder is premeditated killing. Can he really imagine that doctors are giving patients statin, uh, deliberately in, statins deliberately uh, in order to kill them? Um, he says statins lead to hardening of the liver. And they don't. As a matter of fact, uh, statins actually reduce the risk of cirrhosis of the liver. He says they'll cut 20 years off your lifespan. Well, quite the contrary, they prolong the lifespan of people who are at high risk of cardiovascular disease. He says, if you want to have a brain that's the size of a marble, keep on taking statins. Well, nobody has ever had a brain that was the size of a marble. <laughs> and people who take statins have the same size brain as anybody else. 
And he said, in a burn unit, we give patients 20 to 28 hard-boiled eggs a day because we know only cholesterol builds healthy cells. He just made that up. <laughs> no burn unit does that. And if they did, the patients would surely rebel. I mean, I love hard-boiled eggs, but there's no way I could eat 20 to 28 of them a day. Um, and he says 87% of a new cell is built by cholesterol. Well, no it isn't. Lipids make up half of the mass of cell membranes and cholesterol only makes up 20% of those lipids. He says 92 to 99% of the brain is built from cholesterol. Well, no it isn't. Uh, the brain is 60% fat and 25% of that fat is cholesterol, mostly in the myelin sheaths around the nerves. So the true percentage is more like 15%, not, not 92%. He says statins shrink the brain. Well, they not only don't shrink the brain, but there's evidence that they may reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease. And he says the companies only want to make money. They take statin drugs off the market when the patent expires and they become available as a generic. Well, that's never happened. <laughs> he says statin drugs are the most dangerous, useless drugs ever invented. Well, they're not useless and they're not dangerous. And he obviously doesn't know anything about the history of medicine. I can, I can think of a lot of drugs that were far more dangerous and useless. And this is the best part of the whole video. He tells us that our table salt is made up of one third salt, one third glass, and one third sand. <laughs> and he explains how the glass gets absorbed into your body and ends up in your arteries and the glass particles cut little, uh, little holes in your arteries and you start bleeding to death inside your arteries and cholesterol comes to the rescue. It comes along and seals up those wounds and saves your life. Well, uh, obviously the FDA test salt and requires that any table salt sold in the United States has to be at least 97.5% pure sodium chloride. So how do you suppose he thinks the companies get around that? And you can easily test this at home in your kitchen. You take a measured amount of salt and put it in a container of water and dissolve it. And if what he said would, was true, you should end up with a residue in the bottom of the container that's equal to two thirds of the amount of salt that you put in. Now, Rational Wiki has an article about Mr. Coldwell. It says, any man who genuinely fails to understand the fact that glass and sand are not actually soluble in water is probably not best place to offer health advice. <laughs> now, he's probably the worst denialist, but he's far from the only one. There's Joseph Mercola, who says cholesterol is not the cause of heart disease. He says statins impair numerous biological functions and they cause birth defects. There's no evidence of that. And there's Mike Adams, the health ranger. He tells us that the research on statins is 100% fabricated, but he doesn't tell us how he knows this. He says cholesterol has no effect, lowering, lowering cholesterol has no effect on the risk of heart disease or death. The statins are totally worthless. He says flu vaccines are worthless to patients on statins and both of them cause brain damage. I don't think so. And he repeats the myth about table salt being one third glass and one third sand. There's an article in Huffington Post that calls statins an unsafe, unnecessary product that will now be recommended to healthy people to make them sicker. And then there's THANKS, the International Network of Cholesterol Skeptics. It's an organization of doctors and scientists whose avowed purpose is to oppose that animal fat and high cholesterol play a role. Now, most scientists don't oppose a hypothesis. They investigate it and test it. And on their home page, uh, THANKS ask people to uh, write in uh, reports of cholesterol side effects. And they ask them to sign a petition that they want to send to the World Health Organization about statin side effects. Now, clearly these are not scientists looking for the truth. These are biased people with an agenda. And they explain their ideas in books like Uffi Ravenskov's The Cholesterol Myths and Malcolm Kendrick's The Great Cholesterol Con. 
and they cherry pick their studies and they use flawed logic. In the Skeptics Dictionary, Bob Carroll shows how they use distortions and deceptive techniques in their arguments. One reviewer of Kendrick's book describes it as full of sarcastic humor. And he says, readers with a background in the relevant science might also laugh at some of the egregious scientific errors in the book and some of Kendrick's poorly, poorly conceived speculations. Now, what do they mean by cholesterol? Um, some of the de denialists seem to be confusing cholesterol in the diet with cholesterol levels in the blood. And um, the evidence shows that dietary cholesterol doesn't have a very big impact on cardiac risk, but blood cholesterol levels clearly do, particularly LDL, the low density lipoprotein fraction of cholesterol and maybe some of the other factors. Uh, there's a consensus statement that was put out by the European Atherosclerosis Society. They said LDL cholesterol causes atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. It's dose dependent, it's a log linear association, it's independent of other risk factors. It's consistent across multiple lines of evidence. Uh, the evidence includes 200 studies, 2 million participants, and 20 million person years of follow up. And it's been established that lowering LDL reduces the risk and the benefit is proportion, proportional to the absolute reduction in LDL. Now, one of the reasons people mistrust science is that it keeps changing its mind. But we all know that's a good thing. We wouldn't want science to be dogmatic and unchanging. We want it to be responsive to new evidence as it comes along. And uh, scientists have been gradually groping their way towards an understanding of atherosclerosis. We know that fatty, uh, fatty deposits form in the arteries and that they predispose to blood clots. And one of the early hypotheses was that the cause was cholesterol in the diet. And they did some studies in 1913, they did a study in rabbits in Russia where they fed them a high cholesterol diet and sure enough, the rabbits developed atherosclerosis. But rabbits are not humans. And in 1951, a man named Ansel Keys did an epidemiologic study. Uh, he, he found that countries where people ate more fat had a higher incidence of heart disease. Um, now, his research was subsequently discredited for poor methodology. <clears throat> it seems he started with 22 countries and then he threw out all but the seven countries that best supported his hypothesis. <laughs> but based on these faulty, faulty studies, uh, some of the earliest diet recommendations were, um, oops. So the earliest recommendations were to decrease the amount of cholesterol in your diet. And when people did that, uh, it led to all kinds of interesting marketing developments. We had uh, cholesterol free egg products, restaurants started offering uh, uh, egg white omelets with no yolks. And we had products offered for sale that said no cholesterol. I remember seeing a label on a can of vegetable shortening that said no cholesterol. Well, no vegetable shortening has ever contained cholesterol or could possibly contain cholesterol because it's a plant product and cholesterol only, cholesterol only comes from animal products. Well, after a while, uh, studies started showing that, well, maybe it's not the cholesterol, maybe it's the total fat in the diet. So they recommended a low fat diet and that backfired because when people took fat out of their diet, they tended to replace it with carbohydrates and to eat more calories and they gained weight. And then they decided, well, it's not so much total fat, some fats aren't so bad for you, but it's the saturated fat that's the problem. So people tried to eliminate saturated fats from their diet. They ended up replacing them sometimes with trans fats, which were even worse. The trans fats are so bad that uh, numerous countries have uh, passed laws to limit the, uh, limit the amount of trans fats in, in foods. And then Gary Tobbs came along and he says, well, it's not cholesterol at all, it's carbohydrates and everybody should eat a low carbohydrate diet. He published two 
two best-selling books on that thesis. And then he changed his mind. Now he says, oh, some carbohydrates are okay, but it's sugar. Sugar is the cause of heart disease, obesity, diabetes, and all the diseases of civilization. I'm not convinced. Now, one of the biggest arguments of the statin denialists is that doctors are writing too many prescriptions. They say that 93% of the people who are taking statins won't benefit from them. And that's true. But that doesn't mean what they'd like us to think it means. Now, here's something a lot of people don't realize. Most of the people who take any medication won't benefit from it. You know, that's hard to realize, and I tend to forget it myself, and it's counterintuitive. But I want to say it again because it's an important fact to know. Most of the people who take any medication won't benefit from it. Here are some examples. NNT is the number needed to treat. You know, we routinely treat atri atrial fibrillation with warfarin or coumadin. And we have to treat 25 patients with atrial fibrillation to prevent one stroke. We have to, to treat 42 patients to prevent one death. We re routinely use antibiotics for sinus infections, but the NNT for that is 15. We routinely treat high blood pressure with medication, and it lowers the ver medication very, the, lowers the blood pressure very satisfactorily. But we have to treat 125 patients to prevent one death from, blood, from high blood pressure, 100 patients to prevent one heart attack, and 67 patients to prevent one stroke. Now, the best way to visualize this dilemma is with a graphic decision aid, like this one from the Mayo Clinic. You go online, and uh, they ask a series of questions. You put in the patient's risk factors, their age, their sex, their uh, total cholesterol and HDL levels, their blood pressure, whether they're diabetic, whether they smoke. And you get a, a chart like this. And I, I got this one by putting in hypothetical numbers for a hypothetical middle-aged male with several risk factors. And there's two panels. The one on the left shows you uh, what would happen to 100 people with similar risk factors to the patient whose data went into the, into the chart. And uh, the green dots represent people who will not have a heart attack. And without treatment, 70, 75 people with that same risk profile will not have a heart attack. And 25 people, the yellow dots, will have a heart attack. The panel on the right shows you what happens when a similar group of patients take statins. Well, the green dots don't change. The people who were not going to have a heart attack are still not going to have one. But the yellow dots have changed. Now, instead of 25 heart attacks, there's only 14. And 11 of the, dot, of the dots have tur turned from yellow to blue. These are people who are saved from having a heart attack because they took statins. Now, you can look at this pessimistically and say, well, gee, out of those 100 people, um, 89 of them didn't get any benefit. They were no better off than if they hadn't taken statins, so it was all for nothing. Or you can look at it optimistically and say, look, we saved 11 people from having a heart attack. And uh, if you put it into the number needed to treat terms, we had to treat 11 peop uh, 100 people to prevent those 11 heart attacks. And that works out to an NNT of nine, which is a whole lot better than the numbers I showed you on the previous slide. Um, now, this was a hypothetical patient with a relatively high risk. And the NNT is going to change. It'll go up and, up and down depending on whether you have higher or lower risk than, than this particular example. And it's a gamble. Um, it's like the lottery or like the slots in Vegas, only with much better odds. I like to think of it as insurance. Now, most of us insure our houses against fire, but there aren't very many house fires. Now, the evidence evolved slowly. At first, we had evidence that statins worked for secondary prevention, for preventing heart attacks in people who'd already had a heart attack. 
And uh, then they said, well, what about primary prevention? Would it, would it work for someone who hadn't had a heart attack yet? And they tested and found out, yes, it would. Most of the early studies were done in men. So they went back and looked at women. And sure enough, women benefited too. And most of the early studies didn't involve very elderly people. So they looked at the effect on the elderly. And they found that statins worked for them too, maybe just not as well. Now, the evidence still is, is not very clear cut on them. And uh, there's still controversy about which elderly people should be treated. But statins clearly work. They reduce the rate of heart attacks in at-risk patients by as much as 50%. For every one millimole per liter reduction in LDL, there's a reduction of 25% a year in cardiovascular events. And with a two millimole per liter reduction, the risk is reduced by 45%. And the benefits are proportional to the degree of LDL reduction. In 2013, the Cochrane Group did a meta-analysis. They looked at all of the uh, studies with good methodology that compared statins to placebos. And they found that on average, statins lowered the LDL by 39 milligrams. They reduced all-cause mortality by 14%, fatal and non-fatal cardiovascular disease by 22%, coronary heart disease by 27%, stroke by 22%, and they reduced the need for revascularization surgery by 38%. And uh, the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association have come out with treatment guidelines. And um, they recommend that statins should be given to anyone who has clinical atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. It includes anyone who has symptoms and anyone who has a history of a heart attack or stroke. They recommended statins for people who don't have clinical disease if their LDL is greater than 190. If their LDL is between 70 and 189, and they're between the ages of 40 and 75, they recommend statins for patients who have diabetes or who have an estimated 10-year risk of 7.5% or higher, and they provide risk tables. Now, these are just guidelines. They're not mandates. They're not written in stone. And the clinician is expected to uh, look at this information and put it into perspective with everything else they know about the patient. And the guidelines clearly state that lifestyle modification should be tried first and should be continued along with statins when statins are prescribed. Now, the second big objection of statin denial is, is that statins cause devastating side effects in most of the people who take them, which is not true. But people on statins have reported all kinds of symptoms like muscle pain, cancer, dizziness, depression, acidosis, pancreatitis, cataracts, heart failure, hunger, nausea, sleep problems, ringing in the ears, memory loss, and my favorite, a sense of detachment. <laughs> now, these are just anecdotal reports from patients, and they don't mean anything unless they're put into context and uh, compared to a comparison group that's not on statins. Uh, patients taking inert placebos report side effects like these too. And people who aren't taking placebos and aren't taking anything report symptoms like this. So uh, they had to do studies where they compared the reports of side effects in patients on statins and on placebos. And they found that there was only a correlation with three things, myopathy, diabetes, and hemorrhagic stroke. But these things don't happen very often. If you treat 10,000 patients for five years, you'll see five to 10 hemorrhagic strokes. But 85% of strokes are not hemorrhagic strokes, they're ischemic strokes caused by reduced blood flow, the very thing that statins are designed to prevent. So statins may cause a few hemorrhagic strokes, but they prevent a far greater number of ischemic strokes. You'll see 50 to 100 new cases of diabetes. Now, that was the original estimate. And since then, there have been some systematic reviews that suggest that the risk is much less than that. And some of these people may have been reclassified as diabetics because their blood sugar level just rose a few points, and it just pushed them barely over the arbitrary cutoff to diagnose diabetes, which really wouldn't mean very much. And uh, at any rate, the clinical significance of these new di diabetes diagnoses is minimal when you weigh it against the benefits of statins. And uh, in those 10,000 patients, you'll see five cases of myopathy. 
Now, muscle pain and weakness are widely reported by people on statins, but muscle pain and weakness are common complaints and they could be due to a lot of other causes and most of the time they're not really related to the statins. In placebo control studies, they've shown that after, out of 10,000 patients, 10 to 20 will develop muscle pain and weakness. And only one of those 10 to 20 will be diagnosed with myopathy and have to stop taking the statins. And there's a, a rare complication of, of statin therapy called rhabdomyolysis, but that only occurs in two to three cases out of every, every 100,000 patients. And it's usually reversible by stopping the drug. And it's not all bad news. There are good side effects too. There are studies suggesting that statin, is, well, we know that statins have an anti-inflammatory effect. And there are studies suggesting that they're beneficial for cancer, for neurologic diseases like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and multiple sclerosis, for liver disease, for inflammatory disease. There was even a study recently sh that showed that they improved heart structure and function. Now, no one would prescribe these uh, drugs for these reasons, but it's nice to think that if someone is taking statins, for uh, reducing the cardiac risk that they might have some other benefits from it like these. You know, denialism can kill. And in the UK, there were some media reports that exaggerated the claims of statin side effects. As a result, 200,000 patients stopped taking their statins. And this, th this was estimated to uh, mean that 2,000 to 6,000 people were going to die over the following decade. And a third argument against statins is big pharma. Uh, they complain that most of the studies of statins were funded by big pharma. Well, that's only natural. I mean, they've got a product that they want to get on the market. They have to study it, and they're the ones who are motivated to fund the studies. Not all of, them are, not all of the studies were funded by the pharmaceutical companies. And if they were, that doesn't invalidate the studies. It just means we should be alert to the possibility of bias, which we should be anyway for any scientific study. And uh, they're very alarmed because Big Pharma is making so much money off statins. And they say they have the qui bono argument. Who benefits? Well, obviously, they benefit financially. They say, follow the money. Where you find incredible amounts of money, you'll find incredible impetus for crimes rating from fibbing all the way to outright fraud. Well, yeah, they make big profits, but what if you were a scrupulously honest company that had a very valuable product that was beneficial for a lot of people? Uh, well, you could make big profits without any need for fibs or fraud, and they haven't shown us any evidence that the companies are engaging in fibs or fraud. So to conclude, I'd like to show you uh, Adam Savage of the Mythbusters, he wears a t-shirt that says, I reject your reality and substitute my own. And this is actually a quotation from an old science fiction film. Now, there are two realities. There is, we have an internal reality and an external reality. Our internal reality is made up of our thoughts and our emotions and our beliefs. And that's different from everyone. There are as many individual different of internal realities as there are humans. But there's an external reality that we all share, the external material world. And if we deny that that real world exists, it's likely to come back and bite us. And um, science is the only reliable way to learn about that real material world that we all share. And we deny it at our peril. Thank you.